Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in the next installment in our Deep Look Public Speaker Series. I am Kit Pogliano, the Dean of the School of Biological Sciences at UC San Diego. On behalf of the School of Biological Sciences and our partners at UC TV, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for today's presentation on how AI is accelerating discovery and shaping biomedical research. Artificial intelligence has reached into virtually every aspect of our lives, and its capabilities continue to expand in multiple areas, from healthcare to education and commerce. Today's presentation will provide you with a snapshot of how AI is being used in biomedical research in academia and industry, as well as a glimpse into the future of this powerful technology. Before I introduce today's speakers, I would like to invite you to join us in early 2024 when we will revisit the artificial intelligence revolution, this time through the lens of how it's being deployed in medicine and healthcare. Now, I'd like to thank our four speakers for joining us today and sharing how they are working with artificial intelligence to accelerate discovery. Following the presentations, we will welcome questions from the audience. So please submit your questions and we will answer them as time allows. Our first speaker is Terry Sanowski, who is a distinguished professor in the UC San Diego Department of Neurobiology and at the Salk Institute. The goal of Terry's lab is to discover the principles that link brain mechanisms and behavior. And he is a pioneer in combining experimental and computational approaches to understand the biophysical property of synapses, neurons, and large networks of neurons. Terry received his PhD in physics from Princeton University and was a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University and Harvard Medical School. He served on the faculty at John Hopkins University and was a Wiersma visiting professor of neurobiology and a Sherman Fairchild distinguished professor at Caltech prior to joining UC San Diego and the Salk Institute. Terry, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for that introduction. My goal here is to introduce you to a really important advance that's occurred in artificial intelligence over the last 10 years. And it is a very close relationship now that uh, AI has with neuroscience. So here's the timeline for artificial intelligence. The term itself goes back to 1956, when uh, a, a group of researchers in computer science uh, wanted to write computer programs that were intelligent. Unfortunately, that turned out to be a much more difficult problem than anybody imagined. And it wasn't really until the century that progress was made on the really difficult problems. Uh, and interestingly, it wasn't with uh, writing computer programs, rather it was with building a completely new computer architecture that was based on the principles that we see in nature, in brains. Now, on the upper right-hand corner here, uh, you can see the relationship between AI, the traditional AI, and machine learning. So machine learning in the 90s made a huge impact by using data and using data to be able to solve problems. Uh, and, and, and that's learning turns out to be the magic sauce to be able to solve these difficult problems. Now within machine learning, there's a, a branch called deep learning, which is inspired by the brain. And it consists of, of, of many, many processing units connected very uh, densely and being able to teach them by giving many, many examples. And I'm going to give you some three examples in this uh, lecture. I'm going to tell you about vision, how vision was solved with deep learning, how uh, you can even use uh, several learning algorithms, uh, not just uh, the ones that were developed for these deep learning networks, but also for uh, being able to uh, be able to solve difficult problems, for example, like the game of Go, uh, making decisions. And finally, there's the language uh, problems that uh, recently have been very, very uh, exciting uh, that have been solved by a, an architecture called the Transformer. So this is a, a roadmap, three different examples. Now, here, here's the exciting part for me, and that is we finally are making progress both on understanding human intelligence by seeing how artificial intelligence is able to solve problems, and then similarly, artificial intelligence by looking at how nature solved problems is being able to improve the performance of, of, of these uh, large language net, net models that you'll be hearing about. So this is a, a really unprecedented in, in the, the 
development of artificial intelligence, that these two groups are talking to each other and, and helping each other. Now, just to compare the power of the human brain, this is the largest supercomputer on the Earth. It's an exaflop computer frontier at the Oak Ridge National Lab, and it is capable of doing a billion, billion operations per second. So your desktop does about a billion operations per second. So it's about the power of a billion desktop computers. Your brain is much more powerful than this frontier computer. And that's because it has many more computing elements, 100 billion neurons in your brain, and there's a million billion connections between them. So this is where we were trying to head for. Now here is a very simplified version of a network model to give you a sense for how th these models are put together. And this goes back to the 1980s. I worked on this back uh, you know, when we were trying to develop these learning algorithms. I was involved in that, uh, in that era. So first of all, do you get inputs? Those could be uh, words, they could be voice, they could be pictures. But the idea is that it goes through a layer of units called a hidden layer, and then from there to the output. And these connections here have, have strengths and, and they can be adjusted according to the performance of the output. So if the output is wrong, for example, the error can be back propagated in the sense of, of going from the output to the input in order to change the weights to be able to prove the performance. And if you give many, many, many examples, uh, eventually you'll be able to uh, solve difficult problems, for example, categorizing objects and images. So here is an example of where we are today. Back in the 80s, we could only put one layer of hidden units in, but now we can put in dozens of layers. Uh, and what I'm showing at the top is, is the way that the human visual cortex is organized. And on the bottom is a parallel version of, of, a, of, a, of a neural network, of, which was designed by Jan LeCun, which replicates the uh, capabilities of the human visual cortex. So here's the... The cortex on the left is where the input comes in, V1, and then there's a hierarchy of areas, V2, V3, V4, and then finally, back in the front of the brain here on the side is where you recognize objects. So here is now the, the large, this is a very, very large network uh, that was designed to recognize objects and images. You give it images, you train up to recognize, in this case, from a database of 10 million images of 10,000 different categories of objects, and eventually you get uh, properties. These units here create, take on properties. They respond to particular features, and they turn out to be similar to the features that are found in the corresponding layers of the visual cortex. Now, the uh, point, though, is at the end, you're able to categorize as well as humans. So this, in a sense, both helped us build a, an artificial version of the human visual cortex, but also now neuroscientists are, understand a little bit better of what the meaning is of the different units at the different levels in that hierarchy. Okay, so that's one learning algorithm. That, that's the cortical learning algorithm, but there's another learning algorithm deep, very deep in your brain in something called the basal ganglia. And, and this is a part of the brain that helps us learn how to make decisions and decide what to do next. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, for example, if you're learning to play tennis, you have to practice, 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 and, and that means making one move after the next with your racket in order to be able to hit the ball. And you, you need to practice, and the reason is that the, your basal ganglia is responsible for learning sequences of actions to reach a goal, a reward. And we know how it does that. It does that with these dopamine neurons. These dopamine neurons are neuromodulators that uh, detect when you're making an error and then broadcast that error to the entire basal ganglia and the entire cortex. And, and that improves the performance incrementally. Uh, every time you take a swing, you get a little bit better, a little bit better. And it's not just for sports. Uh, it's, it turns out that almost every decision you make is using the basal ganglia. It, you don't have conscious access to it, but for example, you use it when you're making decisions about uh, what to pick on a menu, right? How do you decide that you wanted a hamburger? Uh, but bigger decisions having to do with, um, you know, where you're going to go to school, uh, who you're going to marry, what job you're going to take. These are all big decisions that uh, you can t 
assess with the basal ganglia through a lifetime of experience, building up this uh, decision-making capability of what to do next. So now what happens if you can put these two learning algorithms together, the one I just told you about, which is the, this reward prediction error of the dopamine neurons, and deep learning? Well, you can create a program that plays itself and learns how to play at a level that is world champion. So here is a, uh, the results of a match between the world champion uh, in 2017, Keijie, a Chinese, young Chinese uh, person who has lost three games to zero. Now, he expected to win because at that time, game programs were well below your know, amateur level in Go. And, and what surprised him was that AlphaGo was making moves that no human had ever made before, and they were superior. And, and he did, didn't just lose, he was completely uh, crushed. And he was crushed also in the sense of losing face. Here's what he said. After humanity spent thousands of years improving our tactics, computer tells us that humans are completely wrong. <laughs> well, you know, computers are beginning to beat us at our own game. Now, this had a huge impact in China because Go there is a very popular sport. And, you know, he's, he was a rock star. And, uh, and this, this led to the Chinese making artificial intelligence one of their top innovative projects that they are funding at very high levels. And so, you know, this is something that is happening all over the world. Now, everything changed about a year ago when OpenAI created an, an app called ChatGPT that can talk to you. You can ask it questions. It can do things that nobody ever had imagined could be done. Things like writing short stories, simplifying complex articles, um, and uh, writing computer programs. And this is something that you know was previously something that you needed a human to do. Now, the question is, how did that happen? Well. First of all, GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Generative means that instead of just having a output like uh, in the case of uh, recognizing an object, this network produces a sequence of outputs. It generates, it's generating outputs. You give it a question, it generates an answer, right? That's generative. It's pre-trained and it's pre-trained on a huge database this, this is literally trillions of, of, of words. Uh, and it, it, what it's done is trained to predict the next word in the sentence. It gets better and better and better. And as it does that, it has to develop an internal model of what that sentence is about. And not only that, but it also has to put it into the context of the question that you give it. And so th th there's a lot of training that goes into this. The latest and greatest GPT-4 was, uh, it, it literally took two months of training on one of the, you know, the, in the cloud, uh, and, and it cost about $100 million to train one network with a trillion uh, units uh, and trillion uh, connections in it, a, a trillion parameters. And it did it with this transformer. So we want to know a little bit about the transformer. So here, here's on the left is, is a, I'm going to go through this very quickly just to give you a taste. Okay, so here on the left uh, are these, these are feed forward networks. There are two lines going up. And on the left are the inputs. This is what you give it. You type in something uh, uh, into the keyboard and, and a question. It goes into this, uh, de what's called the decoder. And the decoder tries its best to come up with uh, a, 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 an answer one word at a time. So here it goes. The wor first word comes out because it was trained to predict the next word. And then that is put into the input and around and around it goes one word after the next. Okay, so that is what is happening when you type something into chat GPT. And I'm not going into all the details here. These are just feed forward networks. These are vanilla networks right off the shelf with some secret sauce. They have to do with attention and having to do with input encoding. Now, here is the brain on the right. Okay, you've already seen the the basal ganglia here uh, on the bottom now, uh, and here's the cortex. Now, the entire cortex projects down to the basal ganglia. This is just showing the motor cortex here in color, different parts of the body, projecting to different parts of the basal ganglia. And the basal ganglia, in turn, projects back up into the cortex. So 
what happens is that if you are asked a question, what happens is that your cortex sends the question down to the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia generates a, a word. The word goes up and around and around it goes, word after word after word. Does that sound familiar? Okay, well, it is because it's a transformer architecture here. <laughs> very surprising, very surprising. And that's how AI is helping us understand how the brain works. Now, there's a, a, a particular feature of this transformer, which is very interesting and very important for its very high level of function. When I said the word comes back down here, it's not just the word that goes up, it's all the previous words. And that means you have more and more words. It's, it's, it's t it has a long vector of words. It keeps track of all the words. In fact, uh, in GPT-4, it can keep track of about 10,000 words. And so it can, it can go around and around, keep adding and adding and adding. Okay, well, can the brain do that? Well, it doesn't look like it. We don't see anything uh, like a long vector. Uh, we get one word at a time when we someone tells us something and somehow we store that information somewhere in the brain. But the question is whether uh, there is anything in nature that is able to reproduce this long vector. Well, it turns out there is a candidate, and this is a big surprise. Neuroscientists have known for decades that if you put an electrode in the brain, you get these oscillations. You see it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. And this is at around 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second. And let's just look at two of these cycles. Now, in an array of electrodes, 10 by 10, and, and now this is a sequence of time snapshots, uh, very fast. These are milliseconds here. So this is uh, literally, you know, we're only talking about 30 milliseconds. And he, the color tells us the, 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 the electrical field, if it's positive, it's blue, if it's negative, it's red. And here it starts out all positive, And you can see that there's a wave of red that that just sweeps across the array. That's, a tr that's not an oscillation, that's a traveling wave, and, and it keeps going. And here's now the next cycle, there's another traveling wave that's coming along now from the upper right to the lower left. These traveling waves are found all over the brain in many different frequency bands, and nobody knows what they're there for. But here's the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the traveling wave carries information from one area to the next of what happened in the past. Right, So it mixes what happened in the past to what's happening right now. And now the, the, the way that the neurons in the population are representing the sensory input is not just what's, what's happening now, but what's happening in the recent past. And, and this sounds a lot like it could be a long vector. We don't know yet. It makes predictions, and we're going to follow this up. So I've, I've given you three examples. Uh, in vision, which is a very difficult problem, that we've made progress on. Uh, Holy Grail in AI was these games, and we now they've been nailed, and not just Go. And, and, um, and, and now language, and this is the biggest surprise, because everyone thought language was very special to humans, and here we have this creature. Uh, the only thing we know about it is that it's not human. We don't know, there's a big argument about whether it understands what it's saying, but the fact is, that it's a, it's a really interesting uh, time. It's a new era in AI, terra incognita. So thank you very much for listening and uh, happy to have any question. The next speaker is Romy Amaro, who is a professor in the Department of Molecular Biology at UC San Diego and the holder of the Distinguished Professorship in Theoretical and Computational Chemistry. Romy conducts research at the intersection of computer-aided drug discovery and biophysical simulation, where her dynamic simulations of proteins and viruses are both beautiful and able to reveal new binding sites for drugs and vaccines. Romy received her Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering and her PhD in Chemistry from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She was an NIH postdoctoral fellow at UC San Diego before starting her lab at UC Irvine and then moving to UC San Diego in 2011. Romy is the recipient of an NIH New Innovator Award, the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers, and many other awards and honors. Romy, thank you for speaking with us today. Thank you, Kit, for that kind introduction. I'm here to talk to you today about how we're using state-of-the-art computational techniques together with amazing biological data and artificial intelligence to learn new things about biology, and in particular, viruses. 
So I think we're all existing in this space now of sort of wishing COVID-19 wasn't really a thing anymore, but also really being concerned about still falling ill or loved ones still falling ill. And so many scientists, including myself, have been really working very hard to understand how the virus works down to its many molecules. And so this is a picture of what the virus actually looks like. It basically looks like a golf ball with spikes sticking out of it. And these spikes are actually called the spike protein. And they are really important because they sit on the outside of the virus. And um, they're the first point of contact that the virus has with human cells. So they play a really key role in the infection process. And that's much of what we're trying to understand how it works. They also are highly immunogenic molecules, and so they're part of all of the currently available vaccines that hopefully you and others are protected by. So what we've been really concerned with doing is understanding um, the first point of infection or the initial infection event of the virus. And so what I'm showing here on the left is one of these spike proteins and the key interaction that it's making with a molecule on our human cells, which is called ACE2. I'm showing ACE2 in yellow. And so basically the spike protein and one little part of it here, which is called the receptor binding domain in blue, needs to make a handshake or an interaction with this human protein in order for infection to occur. So scientists can actually, experimental scientists can get views of what the spike protein and what that human protein actually looks like, but they're basically taking Polaroid snapshots. What we're doing in my group at UC San Diego is using state-of-the-art computational methods called molecular dynamic simulations in order to understand not only the structure of the protein, but also how it moves. And this movement of the protein is really key to its function, particularly in the infection process. So what we can do is actually build highly detailed three-dimensional models of what I'm showing here is the spike protein. And the spike protein has many different parts, some of which they can see experimentally, like what I'm showing you, and other parts which they can't. So there's a sugary shield called a, these glycans, which are sort of the colorful molecules coming off of that gray stalk, which we can model. And once we build this whole system, it sort of gives us like a detailed atomic level view of the structure of the spike protein. But now what we're doing with simulations, what simulations allow us to do is to really animate the movement of the motion or the dynamics of the system so that we can understand how it works. One of the key things that these simulations allow us to do is to see things that experimentalists can't see with their imaging techniques. The bits in particular that, that are really critical to the spike protein function are these colorful molecules that are sort of sticking off of the edges of it. These are these glycans that I mentioned earlier, the sugary coating. So these turn out to be really important molecules um, for the function and immunogenicity of the spike protein and of the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. They can't see these experimentally, but we can actually simulate their movement um, using these uh, computational simulations. And you can really see sort of that they're moving around quite a bit. And so one of the things that we learn from our simulations is we can actually show scientists um, what the spike protein actually looks like. So on the left is a picture of the spike protein as the structural biologists see it, which is essentially they can see the protein. As I mentioned, what they can't see are those sugary molecules, the sugar shield or sugar coating, which I'm showing here on the right with these blue sort of tufts. And so this is that sugary shield, and you can see that really um, it actually surrounds this protein in a dynamical sort of fur coat. And it's that fur coat um, that really hides that spike protein or that foreign matter from the human immune system when it's in our body. And so in addition to understanding sort of what it looks like when it's standing still, one of the key things that we can do with these simulations, as I mentioned, was study the movement of the protein. 
And in particular, one of the key events that needs to happen in order for the virus to infect human cells is that this spike protein sort of has to open up almost like a flower. And in particular, that blue part, that receptor binding domain that I mentioned earlier that needs to make that handshake with the human, with the human cell protein, that handshake can only be made once it's in this open confirmation. And so this whole movement of how the protein opens is something that we have been able to show with these simulations and it helps us understand you know, the infection process at a really detailed level. But now not only um, you know, are we concerned with how it opens, but as I mentioned, we're also continually concerned with evolving variants. These variants have particular mutations in the spike protein, especially that I'm showing here highlighted in pink, that actually change, as it turns out, one of the things we discovered that these mutations actually change the movement and the dynamics of the spike protein. And so we've been working with these simulations and other scientists to understand how these different mutations as the as the virus evolves from early 2020 to Delta to Omicron, how these different mutations affect the dynamics and the movement of the spike, and again, how this impacts infection. And so here you can really see a dramatic difference between this, um, this that's the receptor binding domain is now shown in pink, but you can see sort of the difference in the opening that, that is sampled between um, these two variant strains. And one of the things that we've done with artificial intelligence is to actually use the data that we generated at a smaller single protein scale in order to drive the dynamics through deep learning algorithms of, the pro of that same spike protein, but now actually in making this um, interaction. So in this sort of more complex biological scene. And what we found is that AI actually really makes our simulations much more efficient. Um, and this is something that's been done in collaboration with folks at Argonne. One of the things that we're also really excited to do is um, to really break new ground in our understanding of airborne disease. And um, we recently established the Meta Institute for Airborne Disease here that I'm leading together with Kim Prather. And um, we're really focused on understanding what happens to the virus when it's actually suspended in aerosolized particles. And so hopefully by now, most of you have heard that COVID is actually airborne. That's one of the reasons why it's so contagious because basically these, these airborne or these aerosol particles are actually really quite small particles that are emitted when people are speaking or singing or even breathing. And they actually have viral particles suspended inside them. They can float in the air for long distances and actually stay when the virus can stay viable for minutes, if not hours. And so we've been using these state-of-the-art simulations in order to understand what happens to the virus when it's in these aerosol particles. And what's so fascinating is that experimental scientists honestly really have no way to actually see what's happening to the virus in these systems, but our simulations are giving these first, like never before seen views of this really complex environment and how the different molecules that are surrounding the virus in these, in these aerosol particles are affecting its structure and its ability to stay infectious. So this is just a picture of sort of, sort of the complexity of interactions that we see at the molecular and atomic level. This is actually sort of a, a cut through inside view of one of these aerosol particles. There's water, there's different sort of fatty molecules called lipids. There's proteins shown here in green. There's the virus shown in purple with the spike proteins shown in blue. And these really interesting molecules called mucins, which sort of look like these red wormy bits. These are all things that are actually present in our lungs, in our lung surfactant, that when we, um, when we speak or cough or sneeze, they actually also are part of what gets suspended in these aerosol particles together with the virus. So we've been really concerned with understanding what are the interactions, again, in the aerosol particle and how come for SARS-2, it's, um, they're somehow, it's more viable in the airborne phase and therefore so infectious. So what we've been doing not only are carrying out these large scale simulations, which have really been sort of groundbreaking from a size and complexity standpoint, but we're also, again, integrating these mega simulations together with artificial intelligence in a way that allows us to drill down 
to particular regions and then carry out even more sort of sophisticated and detailed calculations, but only where we really need it. And that turns out to be, for example, in areas where you have highly charged particles such as ions, actually mediating interactions between the spike protein and say mucins or with the surrounding sort of solvent environment. We've done this in collaboration with a wonderful team of scientists at, at NTOS. And ultimately, what this is allowing us to do is to understand really sort of the, the inner workings of the virus inside these aerosol particles. What I'm showing here is, again, a cutout view of sort of what the virus is experiencing. Again, here you can see the virus is on the bottom. There's one spike protein here shown sort of in the middle, a sister spike protein to the side, and all of these different molecules um, sort of, you know, surrounding the spike protein and interacting with it. What we're doing here th with these um, artificial intelligence driven or enhanced simulations is really getting down um, into the details of airborne disease and pathogen transmission and hoping to keep everyone safer and healthier as we go forward. I'd like to thank a huge team of scientists who have helped to carry out this work. It's only possible with really sort of a, a mega collaboration of some of the best minds in the world. And I'm grateful to them for all their great efforts. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gavin Hartigan, who is Vice President of Research and Development for the Materials and Structural Analysis Division in the Analytical Instruments Group at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Gavin has driven research and development for complex hardware and software products for nearly three decades with extensive experience in international team building, program management, science, and engineering. In his current role, Gavin leads a large global team that develops advanced electron microscopy products that provide atomic scale insights to scientists across multiple industries. Prior to his current position, Gavin was part of the R&D team at Field Electron and Ion Company, or FEI, where he served in a variety of leadership roles around the globe. Please join me in welcoming Gavin. Thanks for that nice introduction. Uh, so I'd like to start today by having you consider a world where AI helps doctors to predict diseases before they strike, or scientists who design new green materials atom by atom and the semiconductor chip makers to produce new devices with unimaginable computing power. I lead R&D in a division of Thermo Fisher Scientific, where we're actively working to enable all those things. Uh, and AI is one of the tools at our disposal we're super excited about using to help turn those ideas into reality, possibly faster than we might expect. So it's really good to be here today. Thermo Fisher is a pretty big company with uh, more than 125,000 colleagues around the world and we invest about one and a half billion dollars a year annually in R&D. At our core, we're scientists, and our mission is to enable our customers, who are also scientists, uh, to make discoveries that ultimately help make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. We take that super seriously, and we're applying AI to that mission. Now, the division I lead R&D in is home to a number of powerful analytical instruments, including a wide array of electron microscopes. And for those that aren't familiar with electron microscopes, those aren't the, the same microscopes you use in high school biology class uh, that use light and glass lenses to make images up to about 2,000 times magnification. Uh, instead of light, electron microscopes use a focused uh, beam of electrons, uh, which we then shoot down a, a fancy tube at about 70% the speed of light. And then we steer those with electromagnets and we can get up to about 10 million times uh, magnification, which is powerful enough uh, to see atoms. So here's what those microscopes look like, uh, ranging from smaller scanning electron microscopes on the far left. Uh, there we can see things down to about the one nanometer scale, that's one billionth of a meter. And for reference, that's nominally the distance your fingernails grow every second. And then we can see all the way down to the atomic level with our transmission electron microscopes on the far right. Uh, you can see those are pretty large. Uh, and in the picture in the lower right, you can see silicon atoms in the lattice uh, circled there. So very powerful instruments, obviously a lot of complex hardware, but also complex software controlling those microscopes, getting images, uh, interpreting those and turning them really into actionable data 
uh, for scientists to use to make important decisions or discoveries. And that's what we want to apply uh, AI to. And when my team's uh, innovating new products, they're really focused in three main areas you can see represented here, uh, semiconductors, uh, life sciences, and material science. Uh, for semiconductors, you know, microscope images can help drive uh, new chip designs that uh, make better mobile devices or higher capacity memory or more computing power needed to fuel the AI you know, we're talking about today. So it's pretty cool to think about us using AI to make analytical instruments that will lead to more powerful AI. For life sciences, we can identify uh, the atomic structure of proteins using uh, techniques, using frozen samples called uh, cryo-electron microscopy, or cryo-EM for short. And the impacts of this technique can be huge. Um, Cryo-EM uh, can be used to help scientists create better vaccines, as we've seen uh, with COVID and with RSV. Uh, by the way, the first, uh, the structure of the COVID spike protein was first characterized using cryo-EM, which fueled a lot of activity, obviously along with lots of pictures of the virus you probably saw uh, on the news. And as some of you know, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Villa and others at UCSD are actively involved using cryo-EM, not only to understand what the proteins actually look like, but how they interact within the context of cells. Elsewhere in life sciences, people are using cryo-EM to try to uh, engineer plants to be more resistant to uh, changing uh, the changing climate here on Earth. Uh, so that's pretty cool. And then for Material science, you know, researchers are using microscopy to enable an engineer lighter, kind of stronger, more sustainable materials. Uh, we've also done some work with UCSD there on workflows to help us understand failure modes and batteries, which ultimately will lead to longer life and safer operation. So that's just a high level view, but hopefully it gives you a sense of the impact that the instrument technology we're working with can have. And then uh, also why I'm so excited about unleashing AI on that. And overall, you know, like everybody else, we see AI as a very powerful tool for accelerating science and scientific discoveries. You know, uh, history tells us uh, often the person or team or company, country with the greater intelligence wins. And so it's not surprising that across virtually every discipline, you can already see a clear push toward collaborative AI assistance uh, to enable higher intelligence. Uh, just look how many places around uh, that people are talking about generative AI with the words like uh, co-pilot around it. Now, a great thing about these assistants is that, of course, they're uh, very patient with uh, humans and all their questions, but more than that, they have the potential to drive better decisions, in, uh, including in very complex areas, multidisciplinary areas like R&D. Now, you have to be mindful what AI is trained on, but because of the scope of information that AI can leverage, it really gives us the ability to bring together many diverse perspectives. And we already know that diverse teams are more innovative. So think about how many more inputs uh, can be considered by AI. Uh, it can also leverage different areas of expertise and different data sources. So in that context, it's possible for these AI assistants to help us identify you know, patterns, insights that might be overlooked by humans alone. And for any of you out there that have designed experiments, uh, you can imagine how powerful it would be if AI uh, could design your experiment to make the most uh, experiment to make the most efficient use of your resources. So you get reliable results, faster results, and you improve the quality of your research. Uh, AI can also help, you know, uh, automate labor-intensive data analysis. So you can get uh, error out of that. You can reduce bias, and you can create more time for the innovator to actually innovate. So, you know, with all of that, you know, we expect AI to transform the way scientists do R&D with our instruments, uh, helping them to put the mundane tasks of science aside and, and focus more on accelerating innovation and finding new insights, which uh, hopefully will lead to a brighter future, including some of those seemingly impossible developments I mentioned at the start of my talk. And all of that's great and exciting, but there's also a very practical aspect uh, and a byproduct of this uh, kind of science acceleration power we're talking about, particularly for those of you in the academic space, right? We can kind of think about AI in terms of getting more scientific bang per unit time or per taxpayer dollar in that aspect. So, you know, in the businesses that uh, I work in, we're looking at ways to apply AI to our analytical instruments to get higher value answers to customer questions. There's lots of stuff in development right now, but I wanna give you a few examples of AI-based capabilities that are already available in the market on some of our latest instruments. Uh, now, obviously, 
when I talked about electron microscopy, it's, its main use case is to look at really small things. But the true value of the images often lies in information that's buried in them. So it makes the rest of the image more or less waste. And uh, that's where AI can be kind of interesting because we can uh, now quickly detect parts of the image that are most relevant to the scientist's experiment and then perform detailed analysis only in those areas. Uh, so that can get us new insights faster. We can collect more statistics. Uh, and in the case of uh, some samples that are sensitive to, to being hit with electrons, we can uh, keep them from getting damaged. So this particular uh, image here is uh, from an electron microscope that's looking at nanoparticles on a, on a catalyst. And the researcher here wanted to understand how palladium and silver particles are distributed throughout it. And it's a pretty ugly image, as you can see. Uh, it's really hard to see the particles because the grayscale levels of the particles and the, the background catalyst are very similar. And normally, because of that, you know, the material science scientists would have to scan the entire field of view to obtain chemical composition data and then figure out where the particles are. And that could take hours. I mean, it literally could take an entire working day for uh, some fields of view. But with AI, we are able to detect the particles they really care about from a single image. Those are the purple dots you can see there. And then only analyze chemical composition at those positions. And that, that reduces the time needed to get results by a factor of 200. So that allows the uh, scientists to analyze many more particles. And then they can build up statistics very quickly about the size and compos composition of, uh, of those particles. So that's just one example. Um, we have metrology applications where we're using AI uh, to automatically go to a specific part of a circuit on a semiconductor chip to do analysis. So it starts with a tiny biopsy that we've kind of taken out of a, a silicon wafer and put onto a grid. You can see that on the left. And then we, we track all the way through to kind of navigate to the sample, to navigate to the device, and navigate to the transistor, and then ultimately end with uh, specific detailed measurements of various dimensions and, and layers critical to the performance of that device. And that allows the makers of these chips to run analyses with less human interaction and, and, and more accurately, so they can uh, debug problems faster and ultimately get their latest logic or memory chip to market sooner. I mentioned uh, cryo-EM instruments for life sciences earlier. And there we're using AI to tell the user what places on their sample are best to image protein. So that, that will more quickly get researchers to real answers for understanding diseases or for drug discovery. And so what you're looking at here on the larger image on the right uh, is one square out of many on a mesh grid that's only a, a few millimeters across. Uh, that's shown on the left where, where the sample is. And with, within, within each one of those squares, there's over 100 holes potentially containing proteins of interest. And so the AI goes through and highlights, uh, here they're shown as green circles here, the holes that have well-behaved proteins that are worth imaging. And that can save a ton of time, ultimately give the scientist a better view of the protein and, and what it does. Uh, we also use AI in analytical software that uh, can segment and label data. Uh, here, there's an example where we've trained a model to identify in blue uh, membranes and mitochondria in a life science sample. Uh, not that long ago, people spent days clicking tens of thousands of uh, features to tag them manually. And then uh, a last one here, perhaps a distant relative of a uh, Photoshop. You know, we can use AI to denoise microscope images on the fly while we're imaging. Uh, we're not filtering data out and losing information, we're making the information of interest more visible. One issue uh, you may notice here is that the image on, right, on the right, uh, while it looks a lot better, is not completely in focus. Um, and the interesting thing there is you only notice that after the AI denoising. So that's, that's one of the things we can get. Uh, we use that denoiser live and it helps tremendously to optimize system settings. You may think you're getting the best data out of your sample, but you're not. Um, so these are just a few examples that are more image-based, uh, which you, is where you would expect a microscopy company uh, to start. But it's truly just a start, right? There's lots of other things that, uh, that we and many other instrument makers are, are working on with AI to advance what scientists will be able to do with their equipment, and also with all the other things happening in their labs and around the world. So momentum is really building, uh, and it's going to be super exciting to see where that goes next. So that's how we're thinking about AI and analytical instrument development. But 
Of course, we're also interested in the use of AI to accelerate R&D in general, including our own. And I think the adaptability of AI is one of the things we're really looking to leverage here because we see when we train AI models on application specific data, we can create uh, more tailored, more powerful results for a specific field or area of study. And as we've already kind of discussed, AI excels at handling vast amounts of data. So we can, we can tag and manage information much more efficiently than humans can. Uh, and that gives us the possibility to get some insights uh, and summarize things in a way that were just not feasible uh, before. And then from an engineering perspective, you know, we're looking at many areas that uh, AI can accelerate R&D from speeding up prototypes and testing to faster design optimization. Um, and then especially on the software side, you know, there's lots of opportunities around automatically generating code, documenting code, fixing bugs, and many other things. So, you know, given all of this, right, I think it's, uh, it seems to me that uh, the future of science is becoming fairly inseparable from the future of AI. You know, in one sense, uh, AI is a tool for innovation, but it's a very special tool uh, as it can expose knowledge that was previously obscured. Uh, and when you consider the impact AI could have on human health, uh, sustainable technology, understanding the universe. You know, I really don't think it's overly dramatic to think about the advent of the compass, the printing press, or the internet when I think about the magnitude of, of what's here in front of us. And then when you consider, you know, some of this AI assistant functionality that's emerging, you know, AI almost becomes kind of a partner in the quest for this uh, knowledge and discovery. And I would say, you know, for me personally, one of the most striking things I've seen about AI development in current times is that is the rate of change, right? The even the most progressive data and AI experts I know are all finding themselves, many of them for the first time, uh, in awe of the speed and power of the advances we're seeing now. Um, unable to accurately predict really what's coming next and, and how fast. So it, it's an exciting time to be alive. I think the potential of, of AI is tremendous, but it, it will require supreme agility in the face of all the changes that are coming at us almost every day, it seems. So change management, I, th I think, is not an optional skill uh, for those of us in science. I look forward uh, to working with some of you joining this session and the broader scientific community uh, to use AI to drive dream results uh, in record time. Thanks a lot for your time today. Our final speaker is Uri Banner, who is a new assistant professor in the Department of Cell and Developmental Biology the faculty director of the Goodell Family Technology Sandbox at UC San Diego, and the recipient of the Chan Zuckerberg Imaging Scientist Award. Uri develops and applies advanced computational and molecular tools for imaging living cells using a multidisciplinary approach to determine how cells and tissues dynamically organize and maintain homeostasis in health and disease. Uri received his PhD from the Johns Hopkins University National Institutes of Health Graduate Partnership Program and conducted postdoctoral research at the NIH. Prior to joining UC San Diego, he joined the Salk Institute for Biological Studies as director of the Weight Advanced Biophotonics Corps. Uri, thank you for speaking with us here today. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, very kind, I definitely do not deserve it. I'm super excited to talk about how I think uh, microscopy and AI are going to be becoming closer and closer in the 21st century. So the way I got into AI was as a microscopist, um, every microscopist knows this, and by the way, photographers also know this, is we're constantly butting up against this so-called triangle of compromise, where we're always making decisions about whether we want more resolution or we want more speed or we want more sensitivity when we're doing our imaging. And if you're like me, the answer is always, yes, I want all of those things. But the universe, unfortunately, was constructed in such a way that you usually have to make some sort of trade-off uh, in your system or in your measurements. And that can really suck. So let's see some examples of what that looks like. So here's an example of a cancer cell with mitochondria labeled. This is something we're very interested in. We want to know how mitochondria divide over time. And if you look closely, what you'll see here 
is that the mitochondria are swelling over time and they're changing their shape. And what's actually happening here is they're changing their shape in response to the laser that we're using to image them in the microscope. In other words, the very measurement that we're making is actually changing the sample. It, to be perfectly frank, it's kind of cooking the sample. And we're no longer studying biology, we're studying culinary science. And that's a problem. But unfortunately, there's no way to really image mitochondria with sufficient resolution so that we can capture the vision without perturbing them in this way. Uh, and that's reflected here. You can see, for example, on the left is another image of a cancer cell or video of a cancer cell imaged at really high resolution. And you can see how it's bleaching and fading away over time. Everything's fragmenting over here. Whereas on the right, we actually change the settings of the microscope to image with lower resolution and use less laser. And there, nothing's bleaching, but it's also such a noisy, dirty, low resolution image that we can barely make any sense out of it. And we're not gonna learn any biology from this either. This is also true in other kinds of imaging modalities such as electron microscopy. So here, what we're looking at is the same sample image with two different resolutions on the left with a two nanometer pixel size and on the right with an eight nanometer pixel size. And what you can see is that with a two nanometer pixel size, we can get a lot more detail and a lot less noise. So in this particular sample, it's a 70 nanometer thick slice of a mouse brain. And what you can see are these little round uh, circles are presynaptic vesicles which carry the neurotransmitters necessary for transmitting a signal across a synapse. And some of you may or may not know that one of the big goals of the 21st century is to map the wiring diagram of the brain. And that requires imaging the entire brain, samples like this, at high enough resolution to map all those synapses. Now on the right, you can see where the synapse is. That's a stark line here, but we've lost a lot of information about those presynaptic vesicles. However, a lot of people are deciding that we should image more like on the right rather than on the left because to image the entire brain with the resolution on the right would take only 10 years, whereas the brain on the left would take 160 years. But as you can see, we'd be losing a lot of information. And to me, that's just a shame that we could spend so much time and money imaging a brain and still not have so much information, such as how many presynaptic vesicles are docked, uh, how many of these synapses are active. So these are real trade-offs that have real impact on our research and our ability to gather knowledge. So I was really inspired when a few years ago, I saw this article in a photography blog of all places, talking about how AI could be used to increase the resolution of photographs. And, you know, I heard of AI and used AI. We were using AI for things like classification or segmentation. A classic example is self-driving cars need to know if that's a tree or a person or the street or a sidewalk. But I had not thought much about AI for image restoration. So this article was very inspiring to me and led to the question, can we similarly use AI to improve imaging data from our microscopes? And Ultimately, we found out that the answer was yes. This was part of a big collaboration with Jeremy Howard of Fast AI, Fred Monroe, and Lin Jing Feng, who's now a student at Caltech. And our approach ultimately involved taking really beautiful, high-resolution data that would have taken thousands of years to image the whole mouse brain with. And then we developed a highly sophisticated computational device called the Crapifier. And what the Crapifier does is it takes that high-resolution data and then makes it look really crappy and then we trained a deep learning network to learn how to take crappy data and go back up to the really good quality data. And then we tested that trained model on real world pairs to make sure that it would actually work for real data and not just computationally generated data. And the results were beautiful. So on the left, you can see the raw image off of the microscope at low resolution. On the right, you can see an image of the same sample at high resolution. And in the middle, you can see the output of our model when we gave it the low resolution data and then ran it through our uh, model, you can see what came out. And we were able to resolve all those beautiful presynaptic vesicles that were pretty much impossible to resolve in the original raw data. And in fact, in some ways, our model looked even better than the 
high resolution ground truth data because it removed a lot of noise that persists even in our high quality data. So now with this model, we have beautiful clean data. We can reconstruct three dimensional structures from the brain with higher speed and accuracy and ease than we ever could before. So I consider this a win for AI and imaging. It also works for live imaging. I showed you earlier some images of cancer cells or videos of cancer cells with that really noisy data, but at least we weren't cooking the cell anymore. Now we can run it through a filter, much like we uh, did for our electron microscopy data. And you can see now how we can capture things like vision events, mitochondrial vision events that would be impossible to see in the raw data. Yet again, another win for AI and microscopy. So I mentioned before self-driving cars and the ability and the need to be able to identify and classify objects and images. We're using this for microscopy as well. So this is an example of a neuron where you can see many mitochondria that would be moving up and down the neuron. And here with AI, we can actually identify and segment each individual mitochondria in the neuron. Um, but now we have new challenges we have to deal with that again, AI can help with. So whether it's animal behavior or imaging and microscopy data, we have a lot of difficulties in tracking objects over time. So as you can see, when these objects move over one another, they can occlude one another, and then you start getting issues with tracking where the computer doesn't know if this was the object that saw before or those objects that saw afterwards. So we're using something called transformers, which is the same technology behind ChatGPT and many of these other amazing AIs that you've been hearing about on the internet. Um, and ultimately what these transformers do is they use context to get better ideas of what's going on in specific areas of a video or an image. So here's a good example where if you zoomed in on this, you would think maybe it's just a tiger, but if you had the context, you would realize actually that's just a dog. And this is actually a great approach also for tracking over time where we can use the context in earlier and later points in the video to better infer what's going on in every individual point. So this is a, just a quick representation of the architecture for these transformers for tracking organelles and microscopy data. This is spearheaded by a UCSD master student, Adi, uh, Salk professor, uh, Tom Pereira, and uh, computer scientist, Arlo Sheridan. And here you can see an example of what this looks like. So here you can see the live mitochondria organelles moving around in a neuron. And you can see what would happen if we didn't have any kind of intelligence in tracking each of those individual objects. It would just get this insane, unusable problem of switching tracks every time an object passes over one another. Whereas if we use these global tracking transformers, we can get much better and much more reasonable tracking of individual objects, even when they're getting really close to one another and passing over each other. So yet again, another win for AI and microscopy. So you heard that I am now the director of the Goodell Family Technology Sandbox, which I think is an essential component of the future of AI and biology research. And the idea of the sandbox is bringing together what I think are the key components for any effective AI. So for effective AI, you need people who know how to make AI, obviously, uh, computer software engineers and computer scientists. But you also need really good quality data. And as a biologist, I've been really envious of these companies like OpenAI and Google Research who had access to all of this amazing annotated data from the internet, photographs and text that has been curated by human beings, millions or billions of human beings using the internet. We don't quite have the same thing for biology because it's such a specialized field. You need specialists and domain experts who know how to look at mass spectrometry data, who know how to look at microscopy data to curate it and to evaluate the performance of models and tune them properly. So the idea of the technology sandbox is to bring in those domain experts on all of those different modalities that we use for measuring biological phenomena. And then finally, the other important component of high quality data is the measurement device itself. If you have a microscope with plastic lenses, you're only going to get so good of an image of uh, cells, for example. But if you have the latest, greatest cutting edge microscope, 
you're going to get the latest, greatest cutting edge data with better resolution and clarity. So the idea of the technology sandbox is uh, what I think is going to be happening all over the world, which is to bring together all these different modalities of instruments to make measurements at the highest quality data possible so that we can build the highest quality AI. So one of the important components of that is bringing in measurements of different modalities. So for example, there's microscopes that can measure the spatial temporal organization of cells, but there's other instruments like sequencing devices or mass spectrometry that can measure the composition or the encoding language of those biological specimens. And again, I'm looking at groups like Meta, Facebook, Google, OpenAI with Jealousy, because they already have the data sets for them where they have examples of videos where you have audio data and imaging data that you can then integrate so you can do things like cross-modal retrieval where you play the audio of a fire and you generate an image of a fire. Or you can take a 2D image and turn it into 3D. Or you can take text and turn that into images. And our fantasy is to build similar multimodal models for biological data as well. And that could have many practical applications. Uh, for example, there's this amazing paper where they use audio to get better resolution of images. So, for example, if you have a recording of the voice of someone's face who's pixelated, but you still have the pixelated image, if you integrate the audio with the image, then you can reconstruct much more accurately and with higher resolution what the original image or the high-quality image should look like. Our fantasy is to do the same thing with biological data. I mean, perhaps integrating sequencing or mass spec data with microscopy data to increase the resolution of both the mass spec data and the imaging data. Another way we could do this is to integrate dynamic information from lower resolution light microscopes with really high resolution near atomic resolution electron microscopes. So this is just a schematic of how that would look, where we would capture videos of live cells looking at the movement as things like mitochondria move around the cell. And then we freeze or fix the sample on the microscope so we know exactly what was moving at the time of freezing. And then we reconstruct really high resolution EM, electron microscopy images of those same samples. And then we can annotate those high resolution images with the dynamic information from the video data we collected before and eventually train an AI that can predict the movement from those high resolution static images. This is entirely feasible. If you look, for example, at photos of people, we can do a pretty good job of inferring in which image is Usain Bolt moving. I posit that we could do the same with biological images. It's a little bit more complicated because this isn't our language, this isn't our everyday experience, but an AI with enough training data could eventually learn how to infer the movement, the dynamics of the structures from images with the proper training data. And just an example of what I'm hoping we'll be able to do, this is a old image of David Bonner, which is the name of the building that I live in work in. And uh, what you can see with AI is we can actually start to predict what Bonner would look like in an actual video if we had the technology at the time. So big next steps, we're going to need a lot of help annotating all of this biological data. I think citizen scientists are a really great opportunity to do that. We're going to need a lot of software engineering. And the good news is that data is portable and we should be building global networks of software experts to interface with biology experts to help build the software together. The scale of these projects is massive. It's never going to be one lab that could do all of this alone. And we're going to need to partner with industry, hopefully even uh, OpenAI, Google, Microsoft. And we're going to have to start training the next generation of scientists on how to use these amazing AI tools if they're going to remain relevant in the future. And some possibilities of what's coming next is optimization of software code. If people have seen how ChatGPT can actually write code. Soon it'll be able to optimize the code that we write. We've also seen how um, technology can even make new uh, computer chips. AI can help with computer chip generation. And I think it's going to be interesting to think about what happens when AI 
starts improving the code that makes the chips that the code is written on. And then, of course, for specifically for microscopy, you've heard a lot about or even seen self-driving cars. Eventually, we will have self-driving microscopes that can make intelligent decisions about where and when to image the sample. And ultimately, the goal should be for all biologists to band together and build a new library of Alexandria for biological data where we all upload our gold standard data sets and help improve AIs that can be making predictions on the next generation of drugs and biological insight, everything from medicine to basic fundamental research. So with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, very excited to talk to you all about any questions or suggestions or uh, exciting ideas for what's next. Okay, that's great. Thank you to all the speakers for your fabulous presentations. Um, I'd like to ask the speakers now to uh, unmute themselves and turn on their video cameras so we can have a little Q&A session with the audience. Wow, that was, a, that was just a great uh, presentation today. So thank you all. We do have some really interesting questions that have been posed by the audience so far. And I wanted to start with a question for Terry about, and the question is, how far can the analogy between deep learning software and how the brain works be made? And what about the hardware? Are there analogies there also? Those are really great questions. And you have to understand, first of all, that uh, these, uh, they're called neural network models, but they're oversimplified. They're not real neurons. And nature has evolved even more intricate uh, mechanisms. And you saw some in Uri's talk, right? The, the, the round vesicles are actually spheres. And there's machinery there for uh, at, down at the microscopic, at the nanometer level. In other words, nature has taken computation to the molecular level. <laughs> and uh, we're still using digital computers to simulate these networks. So there's a long way to go. Uh, there, uh, we're in, You may have uh, heard about the fact that these models are so big now. The uh, the model the, the models that are being used, for example, in Chat GPT, um, have have trillions of parameters and require a huge amount of energy. And so the real frontier is to take those models and and use the technology, the uh, hardware technology, to take it down to the level of uh, of, of of molecules. And we actually have a technology that is on its way. It's called neuromorphic engineering. It was discovered or invented by Carver Mead at Caltech uh, back in the 1990s. And, and it, it, it is analog. Uh, chips are digital, but you can take the chip and run it near a threshold and it'll be analog and it only uses one millionth of the power. So that's the future of, of, of AI and computing. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I'll just add one thing there. You know, we, we see this too a lot, you know, the microscopes that we make, there's a, it's a lot of complex hardware software. They definitely, uh, there's definitely an interaction. You saw it in the last presentation as well, where I see with some of the AI capabilities, you know, it used to be we would, especially complex hardware, we, we would have to wait a long time to make, get our first unit in there. And then the software, we could unleash the software engineers on it. Now with you know the way we can model things and predict things ahead of time, we can get started on that uh, much earlier in the process, which means that we can do a lot more once we actually have, we have all the hardware and software together. So it, it, it's kind of it's an accelerator for both. I see it. Awesome. Um, let's see, Gavin. I have another question for you, and also the rest of the panelists should feel free to chime in. Um, is the future of AI more uh, for more efficient work? flows through automation or as a replacement for humans in decision-making? I think everyone should add something to this. But Gavin, why don't you start us off? Yeah, you know, there was, it kind of went viral uh, last week. I saw there was some uh, uh, building being built and there was a, a construction company had, uh, it was hiring, had a billboard and it had a chat GPT prompt that said, hey, chat GPT, finish the building. Uh, and, it, and it was, you know, different people were responding. Some were like, yeah, see, that's the human factor. And others were like, wait till five years when robots finish the building. But I think, you know, there, on the, the workflow piece and automation, there's definitely uh, a huge benefit there. I, I gave one example of, you know, being able to navigate to the feature of interest and, and interpret something, measuring something that means something. Uh, but there's also decision points along the way. But I think, 
and it, uh, ultimately humans are still needed to set the vision, interpret the results. And I think, you know, I think of the, the pyramid kind of from, you know, data to information to knowledge to wisdom, you know, hopefully I think AI gets us up that pyramid more quickly uh, and then lets the creative people be creative uh, and, and get out of the weeds. But I, I'd be interested to uh, yeah, others chime in. I'm sure there's other thoughts here. So I, I get questions uh, when I give a talk to the public and the most common question is, will I lose my job? And you, you, you see this in the newspaper articles all the time. And we actually have lots of data on this already. Uh, you know, going back 10 years, deep learning has been around for 10 years. And it, it, you're not going to lose your job. Your job is going to change. That is to say, a lot of things that you spend a lot of time doing will be what AI does. It'll be a partner. And, and as Gavin was saying, that frees you up to be making the, the bigger decisions based on the data that, that you're being, uh, that's being analyzed. So, uh, it, you know, it's true though. I mean, although the, the, it actually might be uh, make your job more fun, but you will have to learn to, to use AI. And that's, that's something that uh, of course, younger people will have no problem because that's, that's uh, their, their brains are very uh, malleable and, uh, and, and, you know, they pick it up very quickly. Well, some of us will probably have to <laughs> have to be relying on the younger people, or at least we'll we'll have to be able to take advantage of of what um, all the tools that are being produced. Thank you, Uri or Romy. Do you have something to add? I'm happy to chime in. Um, I'm still I still somehow remember the first time I used a calculator, just a regular pocket calculator doing a crazy division problem. And instantaneously, it gave me an answer that would have taken me many minutes, if not longer, to get to that decimal point accuracy. And I don't see AI as very different. It's a tool. And, you know, you will not be replaced by AI. You might be replaced by someone using AI if you don't use it yourself. <laughs> And I think this is a really critical point for education, educators, that we have to learn and then teach in real time our students how to use AI for their own learning and for their own research. Uh, and I think this is absolutely critical for a successful future. If I could just chime in on that. Yeah, also with drug discovery, which is something that, um, you know, my group has done significant work in. Uh, certainly, I don't think humans are ready to be kicked off by AI just yet. But the sort of reskilling that's happening right now or that needs to happen for folks, um, you know, in the field is really critical. And, you know, I think we're going to see, we will definitely see, you know, really huge contributions from AI in terms of many different steps of drug discovery from target identification to um, some of the molecular simulations like I've run, prediction of drug properties. And also just for like whittling down this vastness of chemical space, which is, you um, you know, there's sort of enormous potential for the development of small molecules that can control, you know, uh, disease or treat disease, but just trying to, um, to figure out where exactly, you know, which molecules to build. There's going to be, there's going to be a lot there. Thank you. Great question. Let's see, there's a question from the audience uh, about asking what time frames do you uh, look at from conceptualizing a potential AI use to improve a project to actually implementing the process to improve research? Or I guess put more broadly, how do you how do you looking looking forward, right? How do you think beyond what we've talked about, how will AI change the process of research? And what's the time frame we can think about um, for that to happen? Well, Uri, how long has it taken for you to do these projects? <laughs> That's a great question. It was um, pretty quick for us because we are benefiting from the really, really hard work of a lot of computer scientists who have been working on computer vision problems long before us. They've been, as I said during my talk, they've been working on internet photos and text. And really all we had to do was take the tools that they had sort of validated and then retool them for our own work. It's the, depends a lot on the data. Do you have access to the data and the domain experts? So um, for us, I mean, we got our preliminary results within a few weeks. And then because of the way science publishing works, it took two to three years to actually get all of the data and the validation together to publication. 
That's a different story. That's a different problem. I think ChatGPT is going to help us code, by the way. So soon you'll have AI assistants that can help you write the code with the goals that you have in mind. And that's going to rapidly accelerate the time frame from concept to a tool that you can actually use, in my opinion. So Uri's right, uh, it, but it really depends on the difficulty of the problem that you're trying to solve. And uh, one example that Uri mentioned was self-driving cars. So, um, you know, it's been about, I don't know, five, 10 years since uh, you've heard about that. And, uh, you know, they're, they're tootling around uh, various cities, uh, Phoenix and San Francisco, um, but they're not yet ready for prime time. And, in, and I, I wrote a book uh, that was published by MIT Press back in uh, 2018, and I predicted it would take several decades uh, in, in order to be integrated. And it, because it was not just a technical problem, it was a sociological and a political problem, because now you have a period where there's self-driving cars and humans on the same road together, and the problems that humans are not predictable. <laughs> and so yeah. it's, it's a difficult problem. I think overall, though, what I, what I've seen is the 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 horizon uh, for like visibility and what's coming and how fast things are changing is really going quickly from decades to years to months. I mean, I I mentioned before some of the some of the experts in the area there are, are that, that I know are working on some of these new things. Are like, hey, I just saw this last night and I tried this and, I, and in a couple hours I did a prototype that it took me months before and I failed. Um, so so I think I think getting those I think we can much more quickly find those interesting areas to go down, uh, and then you know, and then and then and also it's an interesting time because I think right now AI is very exposed, kind of in its raw form. When we see Chat GPT and other things, where in the past people didn't realize maybe or think about they're using it when Word autocorrects or Amazon picks out the thing they want to order next, and so it'll be interesting to see also how much of this gets built in and, and, and covered up by applications again. And just makes us work more quickly. We don't, you know, maybe don't think of it as as uh, as uh, foreign as we do today. Wonderful. So there was a, a question for Ori in the chat uh, about the Library of Alexandria vision, and the question is, who gets the library card to the data? I love that question. I love that question. And by the way, uh, this actually dovetails with Terry's comment about self-driving cars. I might be a bit of an idealist, but I think that we're held back a lot by not using, by not being open source and fully transparent and sharing all of our data and all of our progress all the time. And maybe Tesla's or whoever's self-driving cars would already be there if they weren't trying to keep it as IP for their own company. And instead everyone was collaborating on building the best self-driving cars together. And that's kind of what I think of the Library of Alexandra is that at least, at the very least, publicly funded scientists have an obligation to share all of their data and their codes. And I would love to see more and more of this. And, you know, especially in this time of war, uh, all through the news, I, I, I see uh, that it's so obvious that the potential of the human race depends on us opening our doors and collaborating and and working together and a huge part of that is that no one has a library card to the data it, it needs to be completely open and meta to their credit has been a big advocate of doing everything open source some of the other companies have been a little bit more cagey and uh i i'm watching very closely to see what happens but i do think a big part of responsible ai is making it open that, that, that i completely agree with Uri. Uh, there's something that's happening which is really important, which is that uh, a lot of the uh, the large uh, high tech companies uh, that are building these these massive uh, large uh, you know massive uh, large language models, and they're putting hundreds of millions of dollars, billions of dollars into it, and and now what they're doing is closing that and not making it accessible to academics or anybody. And, uh, you know, that's going to slow progress because they're going to be, it's going to be their little walled garden. And, uh, but uh, there was a renegade, Meta, that released their Llama, a large language model, open source to developers. And so, you know, the barn door is open now. You, know, <laughs> you can't close it. 
but uh, the, but the, the the spirit of sharing is essential in science, and um, and also you know it's interesting technology. You you you, know, you uh, Gavin gave the example where you prototyped it, it worked the first time, but in engineering, you know you 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 sort of you can get it off the ground, but to actually make it uh, a product takes a long time. A lot of engineering has to go into it, optimizing, uh, you know, getting it battle tested so it's, it's easy to use and so forth. And you know, uh, this is this is what's going to have to happen for products that get into the public's hands. It's the same with drug discovery too. You know, just there's a you know for the for the models that need to be generated with AI, they need data to learn on. And there's, uh, you know, there's been a lot of siloing of uh, really super valuable data for IP reasons, you know, that hopefully, um, you know, there will be a cultural change on trying to just really discover and advance, you know, better therapeutics for everyone. We, there was a protein database, structured uh, database of uh, three-dimensional structures of proteins that Brookhaven created, a uh, protein database. And... Uh, you know, it, 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 it actually, uh, back in the old days, and we're talking about the sixties and seventies, crystallographers would wouldn't didn't want to give away their coordinates because, of course, they can keep mining them for you know binding pockets and things. So, Nature and other scientific publications said we wouldn't publish your particle unless you put your coordinates in the database. Now, fast forward, it turns out that that database was used by DeepMind to create a uh, artificial. Uh, alpha go, alpha fold program that could predict structures of new proteins that have never been crystallized before, and uh, and that that tra that's going to transform biology as as much as protein sequencing has transformed biology. It will take uh, you know and 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 specifically for problems that you've, Romy was telling us about. Yeah, it already is it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. So I was wondering if you each could tell us, you know, where you think this technology will go in the next five to 10 years, or what's the, what do you want people to leave this walking away with? You've really painted a picture of technology that is, you know, allowing us to discover more faster, get higher quality data more quickly and understand it and stitch it together in really interesting ways. It's amazing, really. But what, where do you see us in five to 10 years? How will this change people's well, lives? So, uh, so let me ask you a question, okay? Uh, take yourself back in a time machine to the 1990s when the internet was first introduced, right? And suppose I ask you, well, where do you think the internet's going to take us in you know 10 years? I don't think anybody could have imagined where we are today. Oh, right? That's that is fair. That's the problem. Is there uh, unimagined, unimagined applications? unimagined consequences. I mean, there's going to be yeah. bad consequences as well as good. And so we need regulations. So mm -hmm. there's, there's, you just can't anticipate what, what, where the future is going to lead us, but it's really going to be exciting. I can, I can guarantee that. Yeah. I would, I would think more than five to 10 years, more like five to 10 months is kind of the, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the thing. That's great. You know, I mean, obviously the, you know, I guess my main takeaway would be to, to just embrace the uncertainty. I think there's so much power we're talking about. You saw a great, you know, great examples here today. And uh, so people shouldn't ignore AI or, or, or be afraid of it. It's not a foe. Um, and I think I think it was uh, Isaac Asimov once said, you know, it's better to make a good, you know, make a good future than predict a bad one, which a lot of people are predicting bad ones around AI. Let's use it for uh, for something good and and just stay. We're going to have to stay uh, nimble and, and, and track with this thing. And uh, if we do, we're going to be uh, making some amazing discoveries and at that kind of the speed and completeness we happen to manage it. Uri, Romy, do you have something you'd like to leave the audience with? That's a hard question about where is the future going to be. I, I think that, you know, despite some evidence to the contrary, I believe in free will, and I think the future is what we make it. And I think that we have to agree as a community, as a scientific community, that we're going to abide by certain principles and efforts and goals that, are for the betterment of humankind. And if we do that and we work together to make that happen, it is absolutely mind blowing. The borders between science fiction, fantasy and reality is getting really blurry. I think that we're gonna be able to do things that really seemed impossible quite recently. 
but that's going to require that we really partner international collaborations, massive investments, and we need a partner between academia and industry. We need to have the entire human race helping out with citizen science to help annotate all of this massive data. Um, and the, the world's our oyster. I, I really see this as an amazing time to be alive and we should all be excited. I think that's well said, Uri, and everyone else. I, you know, I think it's a, uh, they sort of hit it on the head with it being sort of almost difficult to imagine what, what it, what it might be like, you know, in five to 10 years, but certainly the near term, you know, there's, there's, there, there will be huge impact in, in many different domains. Okay. Well, thank you. I, I think we're all going to have to learn to adjust our time frame from years to months or maybe weeks because things go can go really quickly and I'm really excited about this interface between the technologies and the discovery and the visualization that's being enabled by all of this it's really really amazing so thank you again to the speakers for your fabulous talks today and the great discussion and many thanks to the audience for joining us and for asking all these great questions. And I wanted to invite also everyone to please join us again early in the new year when we will continue our Deep Look series, um, an investigation into AI revolution with an event focusing on how AI is transforming medicine and healthcare. So please join us again for that event. It should be a lot of fun. We have some fabulous speakers lined up. So thank you all and thanks to the audience and many thanks to our speakers and partners at UCSD TV. Have a wonderful rest of your day.